And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me as always is my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence. Our tag team name is Double Dragons. Fuck off. <laughs> Good brother Xanatrix, <clears throat> we are back once again with the penultimate chapter in our long journey through Veil of the Void, going up on, how many weeks has it been? I don't know, something like 18? Mm -hmm. I don't know, because we had a couple of weeks where we couldn't, we couldn't make it. Yeah, but it's been, but it has been quite a bit, um... The, there are th there are things that we could have covered, but we skipped. But we skipped. One of them was a lot of um, setting detail, because I felt it would be a bit spoilery to go into that. It would, there would also be not a whole lot for us to really say. It really would have just been reading the chapter, and that's mm -hmm. not what we're here to do. No. It's also the reason I try and I try and keep um, setting descriptions to a minimum. And I, I actually think that the things like the classes and other things we've read kind of build the setting in a better picture than we could have. Mm -hmm. Especially given that it that it delves a lot more into the realm based um, magic system. Mm hmm. But for the but for this particular chapter, we'll be going into something that I usually skim over whenever I cover in a, whenever I cover a game in things like Gaming Monk Review, and that is the GM section. And there is a reason why I tend to skim past this. It's because a lot of times GM sections are covering things that I either already know or aren't covering things that I can really cover with any degree of uniqueness. A GM section, at least a, a well-written one, is written in such a way that st somebody who's never GM'd can start to study and pick up on it. Uh, for experienced GMs such as myself or the monk, reading fully through such a section isn't usually necessary. We skim it to find the important bits and bobs we need to know about the intricacies and nuances of the specific system we're playing, but it isn't a, a full read for us like it would be for someone who's never GM'd or is new to GMing. Mm -hmm. And, well, a lot, of, a lot of the stuff that that is going into a GM section is things that I are, is things that we already know about. We know about rules, and or in some cases, are things that we know about but have no, but have no interest in have no interest in discussing. Um, one of them, I, one of them, I've covered in amusing. Um, any G, any game that any game that has the X card or safety tools, I have no interest in discussing either of them. I've made clear my is my issues with the concept, and beyond that, there's not what else is there to say about them, but they're mentioned. Mm -hmm. If you need to know the, the if you need to know the specifics on what I think of them, just l then I would refer you to a older but short but shorter episode of Amongst Musings. In fact, let me let me read off the title here. Um, I believe I had I believe I had called it. Let me see where. Okay, where are you? Ah, consent forms, X cards, and respecting players. Amongst musings number fifteen. And 
with that in, with that in mind, to go, it, it is high time that we dive into the GM section here, which I get the will or I get the feeling will not have a, will not be a glorified advice column. No. In fact, I think the uh, the first uh, first uh, paragraph actually says it. Mm-hmm. This section helps the GM create and homebrew everything. There are That's many an... tips and tr- go ahead. Before you before you go further, I find it I find it kind of amusing that so few games actually give out homebrew advice. Even nowadays, you'd think more games would get would give advice on how to homebrew or hack their systems, and they don't. That's true. It would actually it would serve to create a, a stronger following and a longer shelf life. Mm-hmm. So to continue, there are many tips and tricks to quickly build spells, items, expertise, skills, classes, etc. Veil of the Void, as stated in the core rulebook, is a flavor and freeform rule set. With these rules and gameplay, while these rules and gameplay, excuse me, I misread that, allow your players to experience the freedom of creativity, it can be challenging to run without proper tools. Mm-hmm. He goes on to so say, the, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Oh, I was just going to say, this, 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 well, there's, you know, the extrapolation in the rest of the section. This one paragraph tells you, yeah, GM's Guide is not only here to help you run a game, it's here to help you do everything. Well, really like as, it. as much as it can, obviously. Yes, I am being hyperbolic because, mm-hmm. well, that's my shtick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But anyway, it goes on to say, This section will aim to give you the framework needed to create characters on the spot and rule breakdowns to relieve some stress of world building. It's best, it is best to practice your improv skills as they will be tested mercilessly. Yes, this is not meant to scare you away from being a GM, but to encourage you. The universe is yours to create. These rules help you build your universe. You are not bound to our universe, for these rules are not limiting. You can use them to build a homebrewed universe all your own. Only remember this universe is not just yours, but your players as well. I.e., a novelist is shorthand for a bad DM. Then we start with helpful dice rules, starting with the six dice rule. It will happen. The PCs may perform a contested check there are no rules for. When this happens, start with a base of six dice, which is typically equal to an average three difficulty or monster. If you want the check to be harder, add bonus dice or some auto hits. If you want it to be e- if you want it to be easier for the P- for the PC, subtract a few dice or add some auto miss dice. Their check is then compared against this one. This one rule helps the story continue without interruption. Basically, or, oh, go ahead. Now, I, I before I get into the next one, I think it's best to go to go over what you were going to say. Okay. Basically, this is saying if a PC attempts a check that you don't have a normal DC for a normal dice check for, you just roll sixty six and use the results as what they have to check against. Mm-hmm. And if you want to make it harder, you add on the bonus dice and auto hits. If you want to make it easier, you subtract dice or add auto misses. Mm-hmm. That's that's fucking ingenious. Because there will be those situations where some where somebody might where um where it's where somebody might cover something that isn't in the rules. And I know Grogs like to bring up the whole rulings not rules mindset, which. I can understand the appeal, but I don't think it should be treated as a end all be end all be all um, approach. But then we have the other side of it. Let the dice decide. Sometimes you may not be sure what difficulty to set a check at. If this happens, let the players roll their dice. If they roll well, let them pass. If not, fail the check. 
If the dice rule is in between, build tension in the story and have them roll that check again. This rule comes up only when you cannot decide what difficulty best works for the PC's actions or requests. That's... It is very clear that with these these different dice rules that we're coming across, uh, this is meant to keep flow of play high. Mm-hmm. They want to keep that nice tempo. They don't want it to suddenly break in the center. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Then we have what is referred to as the all sixes rule. There are times when a player character cannot roll with enough dice to complete a check, or only roll with a small number of dice. In this case, you may allow them to roll their check. If they roll all six results on four or fewer dice, give them a reward. They may not be able to complete what they are wanting to do, but perhaps you would reward them with a smaller boon instead. Ah, fail forward. Good old fail forward. That's basically what this is. I think it's actually a more refined version of fail forward, to be honest. Because here, it isn't necessarily saying that they don't, uh, you know, we already have the the advantageous and disadvantageous um, rules earlier in the book, the advantageous failure and disadvantageous success. Mm -hmm. Um, This is essentially giving that to... A, a, a situation where they would have just straight up failed. Now it's you didn't achieve what you were going for, but there's this small thing that might help you anyway. And yeah. it's not exactly a failure because rolling all sixes is a statistical nightmare. Mm-hmm. But it is it is some way to reward a dice check that is super good, even if it can't achieve the desired effect. Mm-hmm. Again, another another way to strengthen flow of play, essentially. Yes. And lastly, in, the, in this section, we have the pre-rolling method. Often a combat will be filled with several adversaries. In these cases, combat will move slower while everyone performs checks on their turn. A trick to get around this complication is pre-rolling. With this, you would pre-roll attacks for the multiple adversaries on on the board at the start of the round. You would use this attack roll on the target you wish to attack, adding pips or bonus dice as needed. Since you pre-rolled the attack, you no longer waste your time on your turn. This is a good strategy for when player when a player has summoned multiple creatures. This way the PC need only focus on their own rolls and not the rolls of their creatures. The suggestion is here simply to improve the speed of each combat round. I do yeah. like this, especially since people can always pre-roll during other during other people's turns just to have it prepped. Yeah. Um, to me, that's going to be more uh, situational. I, I've had times where I've overseen a game and we've been doing pre-rolling stuff and that can lead to people fudging yeah less fudging and more just straight up lying i've 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 again it's it's going to depend on play group for me mhm see next is specific versus general which I, th- I think we we've covered this kind of thing multiple times over the years. No different here. Yep. It's it outright says if rules contradict each other, the specific rule typically beats the general rule. Yep, because specific rules are usually circumstantial, mm-hmm. and so the circumstances change how rules interact. Yep. See, then we have balance of power. Bale of the Void is filled with chaos. Players are incredibly good at figuring out completely broken combos. But that's okay. <laughs> this, this game wants players to have as much fun as possible. But what does that mean for you as the balance keeper? Well, if something is too powerful, simply add something equally powerful to meet it. 
Example, one of your players has figured out a way to stack different conditions non-stop, and it eats away at the HP of everything it goes against. Well, throw a creature that is immune to conditions or explodes in a magic fire whenever it gets too many. However, it is important to not use this power to punish your players. Remember, everyone is trying to have fun together. I have had more than one instances of bad GMs who believe that the approach to take with ki with um, handling ch handling um, people who get too powerful is setting up things that directly get in the way of their combos. I.e., blatant counterpicking. Well, you've got you've got a bunch you've got a bunch of people who have heavy armor. Well, here's a rust monster. That guy does it. Don't be that guy. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I like the part, you know, players are incredibly good at figuring out completely broken combos. Man, we were just spitballing during some of the last documents. And, uh, well, if you, if you have any interest in what could potentially become completely broken, watch any of our class videos. And as an aside... A lot, there seems to be a mindset among some among some designers that peop, that min maxing is something to be ashamed of, or or that or min maxing or some form of power gaming in any form is shameful because it's you're treating the game you're treating the game like a like a um, like a ma like a math or a logic problem instead of instead of focusing on the telling a story part. I don't agree with that no I understand the why people might think that, but I don't agree with that notion because min maxing can be just as much a part of gameplay as much as anything else. And how is it any different than the um than the arguments about op about optimized specs in any um uh, in any multiplayer game or things like tiers in um in fighting games. Tires don exits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, if no, one, if no one remembers that meme, um, get off the internet. You're too young. The point. It, the point is, it's a pendulum thing. Trying to be too trying trying to be too constraining and trying to be too loose are two extremes. Doesn't matter which extreme they are. The fact is, they're two extremes. Anyway, then we get to character leveling, and the first instance in this section is milestone leveling. Anytime a major event is completed, you can grant the PCs a level. These major events take many forms, and it can be sometime and it can sometimes be difficult. Sorry, to decide when to level the PCs. Let's break down a few scenarios to give you a general idea. Arguably, the easiest time to grant a party a milestone level is after a big combat. Then we go into an example of, of, of the players fight back for hours against an onslaught of mechs who are determined to destroy a town with minimal defenses. Many of the PCs almost died, but came out conquerors. This would be a good time to level them. Or maybe during this combat, one or two players defended the gate while the others went to challenge the boss and won. Another great time to level. This example shows a few good times when combat might lead to a milestone level. While bosses and major combat events are the simplest way to level, well, don't forget the other important events. Veil of the Void is a role-playing game that puts an emphasis on storytelling, both in and out of combat, and your group may not be a fighting group, doing anything they can to avoid it. So, when would you level them? Let's look at the next example. Instead of fighting the previous army, they sneak into the guarded camp the night before and manage to hack their way into the heavily encrypted AI hub. This was a major event that stops the war just as much as the fighting did. This would complete the plot point and a milestone level could be granted here. Or perhaps the group manages to talk their way through every single guard and gets to the leader of the army. Here they sit down in discussions for a while and eventually come to a peaceful accord. This could also be a great time to level them. I think I mentioned this early on, but the I 
the fact that it the fact that it describes it as storytelling in and out of combat is something I appreciate because so often we've seen people treat storytelling and combat as mutually exclusive which is anything but the truth to anyone who's watched any good uh, battle anime good you know good combat movies anything of that you can tell the story just as much through combat as you can outside of it no well, anybody anybody who's watched a decent wrestling match can tell you <laughs> <laughs> this is all too true. Mm-hmm. And how, and how many how many um how many times have we seen full stories play out in every sport every sport the human race has ever played? I mean if I list examples now we'll be stopping at the end of time. Exactly. Oh, let's see. The, anyway, these examples assume the players succeeded at what they were tr- attempting to accomplish. But let's not forget failure. Failure is a learning experience, and the PCs could even gain a milestone level from this. We don't give them a milestone level every time they fail. Instead, we give it to them when it is a failure of epic storytelling proportion. Example: the players attempted many ways to stop the incoming army. It even cost the life of one PC who died valiantly. In the end, the army could not be stopped due to an NPC that betrayed them. The PCs narrowly escaped and watched as the city they the, and and watched as the city they needed to protect burned. Sorry, misread. They failed, but here is not the end to their story. No, this is this is instead the spark that lights their fire. They will not be defeated. It is in times like these that failure milestone levels can be given. It encourages them to keep moving forward, to reach that goal, to take their vengeance. Failure is often the best teacher. This is what's also known as takes a level in badass. Mm -hmm. These examples are basic, but hopefully give you some idea of when to level your players. And incidentally, I will always prefer milestone leveling to EXP-based leveling. In role in role playing games, it makes more sense in most TTRPGs mm-hmm. because of the fact that uh, gathering experience points to level up it isn't something that is constantly and consistently happening unless you specifically design that many challenges. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas in the games where EXP works most, usually video games, EXP is, <laughs> depending on what game you look at, EXP is gotten all the time from random encounters. Or uh, let's look at Guild Wars 2. EXP is gotten from damn near everything. Doing side tasks like fishing? Yep. Uh, climbing mountains to viewpoints? Yep. Killing enemies? Oh, definite yep. Uh, Mm -hmm. obviously any of the questing more experience points but it works better in in a medium like a video game because of how kinetic the gameplay loop is how much movement and flow is already there to drag you from opportunity to opportunity so you never feel like you're missing out Um, whereas gaining XP not only could you gain XP but you might be 2 XP off from a level that's happened to me before fucking hated it and you're like well this sucks i have to wait until we get into another combat encounter or do something that i can actually get xp from Mm -hmm. milestone leveling makes a little more sense because of the fact that there are points where people have clearly become more expert than they were before in stories and tta rpgs are definitely very tied to a storytelling experience in general. I will admit there are TTRPGs that are less tied to that. Even the high levels of crunch that we find in some TTRPGs are still usually very tied to the narrative experience as well. And that combination of narrative and mechanics uh, lends much better to milestone leveling. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, then we get starting at a higher level. 
You may want to start a campaign at a level above 1. This can take away some of the roles players naturally get as they play. To counter that, follow the list below. The non-bonus skill points may be invested in skills beyond the level 5 investment limit. The plus 1 bonus skill levels still follow the skill leveling guide and cannot be invested into your highest skill. Every even level beyond 1 grants an additional 1500 credits. So, level 3, plus 1 level to their highest skill. Level 7, level, se level 7 and higher. Plus 1 bonus to skill point and plus 1 level to their second highest skill. Level 11, plus 1 level to their third highest skill and additional expertise and plus 1 bonus skill point. Level 15, plus 1 level to their fourth highest skill and additional expertise. And level 20, an additional plus 1 level to their first and second highest skill and plus 4 bonus skill points. These should be these are cumulative. Mm -hmm. These should make up for skill points the PCs would have missed by starting at a higher level. If their skills tie, let the player choose. I think this is because of the fact that one of the ways you level up skills is through using them. So this is trying to bridge that gap. Yeah. Let's see, and then we have character catch up. Not to be confused with character mustard. Colonel Mustard, is that you? No, he's dead. God damn it. I'm so sure he was the one who killed Mr. Body. <laughs> Oh. Play player characters will die it is a fact of tabletop role playing they may die in a valiant death make a wrong choice or the dice may just determine today is their day the dice gods show no mercy amen <laughs> when a character dies and the player makes a new character we give this PC a few additional bonuses to catch them up with the others these bonuses are based on what level the group is, is and what level the group started the game at. Generally, you follow the guide below, but may add any additional bonuses as you see fit. Follow the starting at higher level step above when creating the new character. Give the new PC one bonus skill point for every three levels gained during the campaign. Give the new PC one expertise and then an additional one for every three levels gained during the campaign. And if one or fewer levels have been granted to the party and the campaign has been relatively short, give them one bonus skill point. If it has been a relatively long campaign with one or fewer levels, grant the player two skill points and one expertise. A short campaign would be five to six sessions played so far. A long campaign would consist of seven or more sessions. These times are guidelines and best left up to your, and are left up to your best judgment. Sorry. I, five to seven sessions with no levels. I I mean, the only way I could see that happening is if you're all if you all started at level twenty. <laughs> Again, I look at this as as reflecting the fact that because of the learn by doing aspect of the skill system. Mm hmm. Just setting up a starting character at a at a level above first. If you did if you did that with in the standard method a lot of games would use, you'd be at a disadvantage. Yeah. I mean you'd you'd have a shitload of class features, but you'd still be at a disadvantage. Mm-hmm. So, next is story creation guides. Here we it says here we have several guides that help with backstory, noble bloodline, business, and other story creation ideas. First being the backstory in inspiration guide. Making a backstory is helpful for both the player and the GM. It can lead to some interesting plot points during the campaign, i.e., the difference between character background and character blackmail. <laughs> it can be difficult to do sometimes, especially if you've never played a TTRPG before. These questions should help 
get the player invested in who the character is, and it gives the GM great notes to use in the campaign later. Um, with the amount of with the amount of people making OCs uh, in various at of uh, in various anime or or the like that they happen to be fans of, sometimes I wonder how difficult care how difficult background creation is for people, really. Oh, well, I'm being facetious. Uh, I was I was going to point out um, Cold Steel the Hedgehog, original character Donut Steel. No. <laughs> Nothing personnel, kid. Oh. This can also lead to some great custom expertise designed specifically for that character. Of course, not everyone wants to dive deep into a backstory, but even a simple one can lead to some great discoveries. These backstory questions are broken into three questions with several sub-questions, all designed to help build as in-depth of a character as you want. Let's see. The first one, the first column is, who were they before they joined the party? Where did they grow up? And I'm not going to go through all the bullet point examples because that's not the point. So, like, yeah, the questions they, are really the important part. Where did they grow up? What was their occupation? What was their familial relations? How well known were they? If well known, popular or infamous? Second pillar is, why did they leave their old life? Was there trouble that caused them to leave, or was it their own desire? Did they leave anyone behind? Did they break ties with important people, or do they have their old contacts? Um, the next pillar is, what does your character want? I.e., what are they after? What drives them to continue to reach this want? What is the highest cost they are willing to pay to get what they want, or will they stop at nothing? Essentially, are you designing a hero or an anti-hero? Mm -hmm. And the last <laughs> is, are they an Arcanting character? How long have they had their abilities? How did they get their abilities? If they do, Did they train their magic? Were they naturally talented with it? Are they untrained and still learning? Etc. Do, do they like their Arcanting ability, or is it seen more as a curse? Have they ever misused magic, lost control of it, or hurt something, someone they cared about with it? Which can happen, because we talked at great length about misfires. Have they ever lost control of their magic? Yeah, I accidentally, op I accidentally fumbled a superlative. <laughs> How Besides, did you survive? Mm -hmm. I had a vehicle. Besides, there's plenty of there's plenty of times where where a magic user in a, in a given story um, had the, had bit off more than they can chew with spell casting, or had a spell go completely tits up. Yep. Um, if I were to use an example of some of this kind of thing, consider consider what um, Sp what Sparrowhawk did in the fir in the first book with with um, Earthsea. Yeah, um, I could also point to an old Ur example and invoke the deep magic. Raceland Majer. Yeah. Motherfucking Raceland Majer. For those of you who don't know who that is, get off the internet. You're too young. <laughs> See, then we have nobility questions. When a player creates a character with the noble expertise, it is best to work with them to make their care to make their custom noble lineage. These questions work regardless of their species or lore. We have how did they become how did they become a noble family? How long has the family been in nobility? How big is the family? How are they treated slash viewed by the other nobility? How well known is the family name slash crest? How do they treat others? Where are they primarily located, or where is the main house? What business do they have their hands in? What duties are you to, expected to handle as part of the noble family? Do they often affiliate, either in the open or behind closed doors, with any crime organizations? There are probably three or four different Battletech jokes I could have made. I'm going to make a worse joke. 
With as much talk of family as there was in those questions, they must have been drafted by the Toretto family there with their head Dominic. <laughs> as there's always room for family. <laughs> With these in-depth questions and the lore on a species' nobility, a player can create a great starting base of their noble line. From there, you can let the story play out and add more details to the noble line as you play. Or you can completely make the noble line up, but we're not here to talk about a knight's tale. Ulrich von Lichtenstein? What? <laughs> Then business operations. Owning your own trade slash company in Veil of the Void is a fun addition to a character. When you start a company, there are a few processes to go through. The, comp the company must have a... Then we, ha we have some of the things they have to go through. The, stan the standard affair that you would expect of a company. Uh, then business crafting. When starting the game with a business, start with a small operational business. When creating this business, it's helpful to answer the following. Then the f gives a few examples of that. And then business prices. If you need a business license or need to register a business, the prices are as follows. For a new company, sign-up fee is 9,000 credits. For a business license, a one-time fee of 4,000 credits. For another franchise or company building, a one-time fee of 25,000 credits. And then companies generate a randomized number of credits each week based on their size. And we have a chart listing the size, base number of employees, and the money it makes. Small, one to two employees, generates 1d6 times 1,000 credits a week. A medium has three to four base employees, generates 2d6 times a, times 1,000 um, credits per week. A large is 5 to 10 employees, generates 4d6 times 1,000 uh, times a th times 1,000 credits per week, and a corporation is 20 or more, and generates 10 to 20d6 times 1,000. As a note, these businesses run autonomously unless the PC intervenes, meaning they make passive income every week. The income given is what is left after employee payment and other deductions. Why am I being reminded of the downtime activities in Fantasy Craft? I don't think this is exactly a downtime activity, though. This just happens every week. Yeah, but what I'm, what I'm specifically reminded of is the lifestyle rule. True, true. Do you know what this reminds me of, though, Monk? What? Speed rankings. <laughs> Just without the tests. Don't get me started. Don't get me started. I had a, I, I had a sheet that had all the answers. No, I, I like the answers are easy. Plus, I had the uh, Prima, the Prima guide, at one point. Um, but no, the problem is. Using all the, advantage, the, the advantages you have throughout all of the beginning from Balaam Garden to the invasion of uh, Dalit and all that fun stuff, um, you can really pump your, your initial rank. But your rank can go down, too. Mm -hmm. And it seems like it's so random that it goes down. See, I have then to we look up the mechanics behind it. Yeah. Anyway, then we have business affiliates. When you register your business, you usually register it under one of three groups: the Sildia Merc Mercantis Star Conglomerate or the Warp Lit Syndicate. Based I think it's on the to be Warp Light. Light. I think. Mm -hmm. Also, um, unnecessary umlauts are awesome. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Based on the group you chose, you gain a unique bonus. Sildia Mercantis. With the merchant fleets of the Sildia Mercantis, you gain the rights to fully sell, trade, and fly with the merchant fleet and trader's guild. Your items sell for 10% more when sold to either of these groups, and you gain an additional 10% passive credits each week. 
Very nice. And we have the Star Conglomerate. The Star Conglomerate is one of the largest operations out there, currently under control of the Star Council and their respective controlled zones. Those and registered Bullock, here. Citizen. Mm-hmm, those registered here gain a 5,000 credit signing bonus and may register their first expanded location for free. And it's full of star citizens. You just wanted to make that joke because this is a complete game and Star Citizen isn't. Who knows, Monk? Who knows? I do. <laughs> then we have the Warp Light Syndicate. Those who are part of this group are often deceiving to the eye. When registered here, you gain access to the advanced web of professional smugglers, as well as direct access to the criminal marketplace. Their illegal goods at a 1,000 credit discount when hiring Blue Scarab mercenaries. So if the Star Conglomerate is, is full of Star Citizens, the Warp-like Syndicate is full of Star Sector players. Jesus. <laughs> no, no, Monk. Star Forge players. I hate you. <laughs> <clears throat> see then we have crafting guides when a player desires to craft items using the crafting skills consult the guides below all crafting checks start as an average three difficulty and require a minor number of various items to use based on what is being crafted for example a clock may require a small metal sheet a few gears and a shard of glass a pistol would require some pistol parts springs and a metal sheet I think you'd need a whole lot more than that for a pistol, but that's the gun nerd in us talking. I mean, pistol parts is vague enough that it could conclude hmm. everything from the firing pin to the fire control group. But I won't get into that. Yeah. Or we could just say that the person is trying to build a looty. No, Monk. No. No, we do not say that. Okay, then pipe pistol. Uh, I'll let that one pass. You, if you didn't, you want to know what I would have used as my third example? No, no, I don't, but you're going to tell me anyway. <laughs> the Smith and Methson. You're only saying that because I'm white. <laughs> Meme reversal. <laughs> no, anyway. Small items are things such as watches, lockpicks, meta shots, etc. Average three difficulty with one to three parts required. Medium items are things such as single-handed weapons and grenades. Average three difficulty with four to five parts required. Large items are things such as sentry turrets, two-handed or great weapons. Hard four difficulty with six to eight parts required. Extra large items are things like mountable turrets, full armor sets, minor mech suits, Tough 5 difficulty with 9 to 15 parts required. The final level are things, are vehicles which fall under massive items. Challenging 6 difficulty with 50 to 200 parts required. It seems like a, a small amount of parts for something so huge. I hope you this know? doesn't mean at twentieth level somebody tries to somebody tries to um, start their side job of build, uh, building starships. Oh, uh, monk! I, I hate to say it, but you are uh, Cyloning for me. God damn it! Not again. I thought I was done with this. I don't think it ever ends, Monk. I want to get off Mr. Bone's wild ride. The ride never ends. Also, Mr. Bone's wild ride was the only thing I could understand out of that sentence. Anyway, crafting checks may also require another skill check or additional checks depending on its complexity. For example, you're crafting an Arcanatech medium weapon. 
This would require a crafting and arcanting check, both on an average 3. Or perhaps you want a great weapon with a unique ability on it. That would require multiple crafting checks. An item's rarity is based on how successful the check was and how many unique effects have been added. A standard pistol would be common rarity, while an arcane pistol would be uncommon, for example. I didn't know Jinx was here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> arcane pistol! Mm -hmm. Let's see, then we have potion crafting. Crafting potions takes a bit more work, but allows for some fun outcomes. All potions start with a base. One flask, one serving of purified water, and one crushed magic crystal. After the base is created, you need the other required items based on the potion you want to make, typically acquired from various monsters or merchants. Additional items can be added to increase duration or potency. Most notably... Villadrak Dust, which adds increased duration or potency depending on how much you add. Half a vial of Villadrak Dust will add plus one round or plus one minute to a potion's duration. Two vials will double the round duration. Three vials will triple the duration and double the effect. But I bet you anything, Villadrak Dust is expensive. Either difficult to obtain or just expensive to purchase at a merchant. <sighs> mm -hmm. Or probably both. Either buy, either buy it for top dollar at a merchant or try and get it yourself. And Villadrak probably don't give it up really easily. Mm -hmm. oh, after all of this is mixed, the potion will require a, heat, a heating element to mix it together and a skill check. Two skills can be used, arcanting and crafting. The difficulty is determined by how many non-base ingredients are added. One to two, average. 3. Hard. 4 to 5. Tough. 6 or more. Challenging. If the difficulty check fails, the potion will be unusable and it will revert to a potion base. If the check critically fails, the potion will become volatile and explode in a 3x3 three three area, inflicting 1d6 times ingredients in pure damage. Ow. So no, I don't know. all of our jokes about how about how um, you shouldn't fuck up when using magic. Well, you shouldn't fuck up when using alchemy. I mean, that that makes sense. And I know I I know I'm going to regret saying this, but remember, if you fuck up with alchemy, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. Reminds me of an old childhood story, a girl and her dog. <laughs> then we have building a class. Whether attempting to build a new spe whenever attempting to build a new species or class, study the core rules. It is incredibly important to know the rules before building anything, as that gives you an idea of the game's balance. It is important during this step to look through existing classes and species to see if you can simply reflavor its abilities to fit. However, if you cannot find a class that fits your specific idea, you can build a new one. All classes have unique level 1 abilities. Most classes have 2 to 4 abilities at level 1. Usually, one of these abilities are the core ability, often limited to often limited by a finite resource. It says B, but it's supposed to be by, I think. Example, the smuggler's class level one smuggler class's level one ability, Clever Fighter, has fighter points which the class must spend in order to activate their unique ability. The other classes provide a great example to look at when designing. The key is to decide what your class will focus on. Think outside of the box and focus on what makes your class unique. For example, the Thalma Tech is focused on arcane spell manipulation by using an advanced Arcana Tech item. Their level 1 ability gives them access to USBs that grant them all spells from its elemental type. Just like a Thalma Tech's level 1 is distinct, so should your class's level 1 be distinct. Classes, classes should have their own starting items and credits, as most classes also give a plus 1 bonus level to a skill the class uses frequently. 
For example, our canting classes typically get a plus one bonus level in our canting as their skill bonus. Your abilities should be flavored to represent your class idea, granting certain bonuses to either role playing or rule play. For exa example given, an ability making the character more recognizable slash famous to others would be a fun role playing addition. An ability granting an auto hit die in performance checks is a rules addition. And then we have a thing, never give a class too many bonuses to the same skill or virtue as this can quickly unbalance or negate a character. A class should have no more than one to two abilities per level and never two abilities for two consecutive levels. Makes sense. Every class has at least one specialization that gains an ability at levels 5, 10, 15, and 20. A spec can give you a bonus level 1 if you'd like a bonus at level 1 if you'd like, but it should be a small effect. The actual ability should be at level 5 when PCs first get it. If you're using a class already developed in another game, example D&D or FF14, Hmm... <laughs> 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 Then look over that class, take its abilities, and replace it with our bonuses. For example, if an ability gives an advantage to the check, as in D&D, give the PC an auto-hit die or allow them to re-roll a check completely. The most important thing is to think of what your class is and what you want it to be. Abilities are best made after you have a basic idea of what it will do and feel like. Then. And then we get to building and expertise. One thing you will have to do regularly whenever you choose to, whether you choose to play in Veil of the Voids universe or one of your own imagination, is create expertise that reflect both the universe and player choices. But before we even get, before we even get into building expertise, I do like the, I like the fact that we actually have proper advice on what to do to make to make sure a class a custom class would fit. As we said before, a lot of games are kind of hand-wavy about this. Yeah. And some people are able to figure it out and make very good classes. But that's usually because they're either good writers, good designers, or people with a lot of experience beforehand. And as we've said before, that is a bandage. Whereas this gives us some very, very specific uh, building blocks. Mm -hmm. No bandages here. We're 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 uh, rebuilding that person from the ground up. We have we have the technology. We'll make them better, faster, stronger. And if all of you think that's a Daft Punk reference, you're too young. Get off the internet. But getting back to building an expertise. Suppose a player wants to have a character ability that allows them to be a detective. Their backstory states that they were once known throughout the universe as a gifted investigator. They have access to the analysis skill, but they also want something to better represent their detective skills. Looking through the rulebook, they came across the arcane spell Scene Reconstruction. They like the spell's effects, but don't want to make a spellcaster. You could craft an expertise granting the spell Scene Reconstruction that allows the player to perform an analysis check in place of their arcanting check. This would represent the character's unique ability to rebuild a crime scene purely with the facts. Just the facts, ma'am. <laughs> this is an example of the game's freeform rules. Encourage players to work with you to build their ideal character. Well, that gives you an example of an easy solution. Let's break down how to build more difficult expertise. Expertise grants small bonuses to the player and are meant to represent things the character is already good at. And then we have just the tip. Notate specific actions that players have taken in the game. Being a GM takes a lot of work, but taking quick notes will help you to build customized expertise more easily. A good time to give out expertise is every four to five sessions or when a player does something worthy of a unique expertise. When building an expertise not based on player decisions, discuss why their character has this ability. Then look through the core rulebook for something that would rep 
resent this request. If there are none, create your own. Expertise have a few unique rules. One, they are passive abilities that grant a general bonus or improve skill checks. Two, they can grant bonus levels to skills, but should very rarely grant plus one to a virtue as that can quickly break a character. Three, they may grant an auto success die to skills or contested checks. Use this bonus sparingly. Four, they can grant plus one bonus die to a specific check. Five, build expertise based on the character's request, backstory, or in-game actions. Six, they may grant a spell or roleplay ability such as the scene reconstruction example. Seven, they may grant unique once or twice per short long rest abilities. For example, a player's combat medic has been performing successful surgeries all throughout the galaxy. They've gained quite a bit of rep recognition. You could then give them an expertise that gives them free food, stay, and work while on a planet with hospital access. This could also grant a small credit bonus after successful surgeries. If you follow these rules and add your own ideas, you can quickly craft a unique expertise as needed. I love this because... How many times... Because, well... Feats are... Are a, thi are a thing that... That, um... That's that is a case of just do just do whatever. Once again, we we here in the monastery really hate the no, the swim damn it approach to character design and just and just mechanics designs period. We don't want our hand held every step of the way, but we do want a general outline so that we know what we're doing. Mm-hmm. See, and then we have building legendary items. Since there are a scant, a scant few in the in the core book, this is get this is definitely going to be worth it. Legendary items are a fun way to reward players for their actions, skill checks, etc. It encourages your creativity and their creativity. While Fidelis's book has fifty plus items, which spoiler warning, we are not going over Fidelis's book. You can never have enough. Here are some quick steps. There are various classifications of legendary artifacts. Common, uncommon, typo, rare, very rare, incredibly rare, and extraordinary. Uh, you should have called it super rare. No, Monk, because then he'd have to call it the next step super, super rare, and then the last step ultra rare. Fair. It's not a gotcha. Common items are found nearly everywhere, while ex where extraordinary items are a one in a billion chance. If you make a powerful legendary artifact, it would most likely fall under incredibly rare or higher. I'd, I'd like to point that a one in a billion chance in the scale of a galaxy is actually quite small. Mm -hmm. That's Those are pretty good odds, and I like them. <laughs> it's not a, an astronomically large odd. Yeah. An astronomically our large odd would be one in trillions. Mm -hmm. Common items often do simple effects such as a self-repairing armor that heals 4 HP outside of combat once per short rest. Uncommon items often provide minor effects such as a bag that fills with XD6 rations per day, a item that allows a novice spell to be cast for free once per day, etc. Rare items are items that provide decent effects such as a pistol that deals damage and applies negatives to its target, a tablet that stores an infinite number of data, etc. Very rare items are rare items that have an additional effect or allow the item to interact with and manipulate items of lower rarity. Incredibly rare items are powerful, often items that grant multiple effect effects per day, can destroy their weak can destroy other weaker artifacts, can store multiple spells, etc. Extraordinary items are the most potent and dangerous of all items. These are items that range from heavy damage in combat to items that are world-ending, such as the Singularity Bomb that inflicts 600 damage and creates a small sun. That's not how a Singularity works, but okay. <laughs> 
I, I'd like to point out that at the Extraordinary Range, a popular example from vintage anime is the caster. There are only two of them in all of Outlaw Star, and that entire show spans a galaxy. For whatever reason, I'd always joked in my head that casters are common, caster shells aren't. Except it's, it's rare on both, to be honest. Nobody knows how to make the casters anymore, and the people who know how to make the caster shells are few and far between. Mm-hmm. But I digress. I just wanted to give an example from popular media because you know how much we like to give examples around here. Mm-hmm. And then we have building a skill. Depending on the setting you desire to run, you may have to add or subtract skills from the game. This is far easier than crafting expertise. All skills gain the same bonus from levels 1 to 6, so you only need to craft a specific level 7. On occasion, you may add a few simple effects to the skill regardless of levels invested. When building... Which we on other skills. Mm-hmm. When building, remember, skills exist to represent the character's active abilities and actions. Passive gifts are represented by expertise. Build a skill by the following rules. A skill may grant proficiency with equipment, access to spells like arcanting, etc., when a single point is invested slash earned. All skills have a unique ability at level 7. Some give an additional plus 1 bonus die or an auto-hit die, etc., some give role-playing bonuses, such as people view you as honorable without persuasion. This level is meant to feel strong as it takes quite a few rolls to earn it. Try to make it unique and try to build off what the skill is used for. Level 7 skill abilities should never grant more than 3 unique effects. Keep skills simple. Do not make multiple skills for the same act unless necessary. Skills that use either a regular difficulty, ch- skills use either a regular difficulty check roll, or contested one. And then we have... So it's... I guess that's the reason why I don't mind the skill system in this one, because... There's a plethora of skills that you can potentially build, and you're not going to have that much trouble with it. Yeah. And and, uh, up until level 7, the bonuses are almost always uniform. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, there were some that had a, an additional on top of the uniform in earlier levels, but even then, it wasn't a big additional. And it's it, it, you you just have to say this skill does is used for these types of actions. Here are the bonuses for one through six, and here's your level seven unique. Mm-hmm. And you can you could create your own. This right here is enough to create your own entire skill list if you wanted an entirely different set of skills altogether. Mm-hmm. So, next is building a species. Building a species is easier than building a class. Picture your species, what it's like, where they come from, and what their ancestry is like. Assign traits relating to their history. For example, the Celestia are living stars sent to this world with a specific goal and are linked back to the celestial realm. Their their trait set grows from these concepts. Define what their standard build, height, and looks are to help others slash the GM use the species in the game. Most species have between three to five traits depending on how much lore is centered on the species. It is helpful to think of real-life comparisons and create skills based off them if you are having difficulty. Next, think of the species' ancestry. How did they come to be? Example, the Celestia come from one of the four celestial beings. These beings have different effects based on the constellation they represent. This ancestry creates the paths that grant a bonus to a virtue, and then something like an attack, plus one auto-hit to a skill, or bonus a bonus level to a skill, a new ability, etc. Then we have a breakdown of building a species. Each species has three traits. Each trait typically grants a minor bonus and can include a major bonus that activates once per day or rest, etc. Traits often grant things such as additional movement, bonus dice on checks, 
free spells, expertise, unique effects, etc. Each species has four to seven ancestral paths, each unique and designed to represent the various kinds of species. Ancestral paths grant plus one bonus point to a virtue. If it grants plus one bonus to two virtues, it often includes a negative to balance it out, such as a negative to another virtue. Additional bonuses are given alongside this, such as additional skill points, extra HP, bonus dice and specific skills, etc. Uh, then, then the next building that we have is building a spell. Oh boy! Oh look. right, that's nice. If you have a mage in your game, you will most likely need to assist them with building spells. Spells can be crafted by PCs during hours of rest and study in-game. They always craft a spell at their current level. For example, a level 5 mage could craft an apprentice level spell. A new spell or one a player is learning always casts with minus 1 bonus die and plus 1 difficulty until the user is successfully cast it 10 times. This represents the user getting used to the spell. Building a spell can be tricky, but the following tips should help. A spell typically does a set amount of damage or XD6 in damage. Inflicted damage is typically of a, a specific damage type, i.e. pure, frigid, fire, etc. Most every spell has a difficulty. These difficulties are typically the ones mentioned in Chapter 2, but it can occasionally be an attack or without a difficulty, like say the mystic spells. Mm -hmm. If a spell is an attack, the difficulty is set against the target's armor. If it is an attack spell, it adds the arcanting virtue used to the attack damage and follows the attack rules. Spells have a duration, either instant, reaction, round duration, channel, or a mixture. If a spell has a duration, it does not go into a cooldown until the duration ends. The cooldown should be equal to one round or one minute or shorter or longer than the spell's duration. Reaction and instant spells activate immediately. Most spells originate from a realm, though this is not always true. Some spells can be drawn from the user themselves or from some other magic source. Spells not drawn from a realm usually have a limit outside of the charge state. It is important to note that if a spell has no cooldown or no difficulty, it does not add to the charge state. Spells should do damage equal to or slightly more than the highest base attack damage of the crew's current attacks. Make sure to keep this in mind as you want magic to be as enticing as, as it can be dangerous to cast. When increasing a spell's level from novice to apprentice, for example, add an additional 1 to 3 d6 damage or additional effects as desired. Careful when adding damage as it does help determine combat difficulties. By following these rules and looking at spells in the core rulebook, you should be able to, to help players craft their own unique spells. Have fun with it. Magic is meant to be crazy. Or, it's magic. I don't have to explain shit. Yep. D&D mm, &D. cartoon reference meme there. Mm -hmm. Magic, I ain't gotta explain shit. Then we have, it's okay to be broken. Often you will make something broken. This is fine. When it's broken, simply dial it back after testing. Better yet, use the lessons taught in the balance of power section mentioned earlier. After all, making players strong isn't a horrible thing. It lets you throw increasingly stronger challenges at them. This lets both sides grow and encourages players to think outside of the box. Never fear player power, just have fun with it. It's also important to keep flavored HP and damage in mind when running combats. And that, which I I think it's a good thing that this is put that this is put in because people do overthink balance. This much is true, but mm -hmm. I at the same time I am not on the side of people who think that balance is unnecessary. There is. <clears throat> to 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 uh quote a favorite maxim of mine everything in moderation including moderation mm -hmm. and then we have building an npc 
On occasion, you may want to create a stronger than normal NPC. This often occurs when players adopt a random character of yours that you never planned to be a full NPC. When creating a long-lasting non-player character, non-adversary, follow the strong NPC creation guide. Which it I like I like I like that this acknowledges that sometimes players just adopt NPCs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> C. Start with three points in all virtues, then distribute four points between these virtues, adding at most two points into a single one. Distribute five skill points between the skills, investing at most three in a single virtue. I think that's supposed to be skill. Add plus one skill point for every two additional levels. The starting HP is ten plus vitality. Add additional four plus vitality every additional level you add. Starting armor is average. If you want them to have attacks, you have melee and ranged attack both at 1d6 plus 2. Basically, you don't make them as strong as PCs, but you certainly don't make them weak. Mm -hmm. Then we have making a combat encounter. An encounter is classified as the full duration of combat and the ratio of PCs to adversaries within said combat. When developing a combat encounter, it is good to know how many adversaries to add to a fight. We do this using player damage versus adversary HP. The easiest way to do this is to use our average player, our average base damage equation, though feel to keep track of player damage yourself. First, choose the average damage based on the highest player level. Level 1, average damage is 14. Each additional level adds plus 3. Sorry, carbonation. As you, after you determine the average damage, find the combined player damage by using the following equation. Average damage times number of characters. For example, if in your campaign you have level 5 players, and the highest level player is level 4, the average damage will be 23 per player. Then multiply the 23 damage by the number of players, equaling 115. This is the player combined damage, or PCD. With PCD, you then need to decide how many rounds you'd like that combat to last, and then add an additional 20% to the total. This gives you a rough estimate of total adversary health, i.e. PCD times desired rounds of combat plus 20% total adversary HP. For ex example, we take the PCD from the earlier example, 115, and multiply that by how long we want the combat to roughly last, let's say five rounds. This gives us a new total of 575. Ooh, palindrome. We then add 20% of this new out number to the total, and we have a total adversary HP of 690, or 690. Nice. Mm -hmm. This HP total can be spread among as many adversaries as you'd like whether one boss or many minions. Sometimes this will not be enough adversary HP or difficulty to help this use flavored HP. Adding a challenging or premium adversary to a combat makes a very difficult boss fight, one that can easily destroy a party. I will say I'll certainly take this over fucking challenge rating. Yep. As I believe I believe one of the big complaints I always I, that I brought up when we talked about challenge rating briefly is the fact that it assumes that you're going to have a balanced four player party. Yes, <clears throat> challenge rating is stupid because it assumes that. Mm -hmm. And granted, this this PCD based setup does make its own assumptions, but because of the fact that it's level scalable, I don't hate it as much. Level scalable and. Uh, also working on averages. Mm -hmm. So that average damage at level one and then plus three for every additional level is an average among all classes. Like this had to have been this average had to have been thought out after multiple playtest sessions. I would not be surprised. Then we have flavored HP and damage. Flavored HP and damage ignores the adversary sheet in favor of story or balance. It's an incredibly useful tool. 
With this HP, don't keep direct track of how much health the creature has. Instead, let the story flow and decide when the creature dies to incoming damage. Perhaps your players are strong, or you give them a powerful expertise or item. Flavored ex ex HP can help here. Flavored HP is, designed to, is used to balance a fight, build tension, or end a fight early. It should not be used to punish players. Flavored damage is used to keep a fight going or save a life. Sometimes an adversary will inflict enough damage to one-hit a player character. This can sometimes ruin a story, so you may have to flavor the damage to keep them alive for a moment longer. It is important to not tell PCs when you use flavor, HP, and damage. Good call. It's fudging dice. Mm -hmm. this is, all this is, is is GM's fudging rolls to make the game better. That's all that is, and I fucking love that it's a mechanic. Mm -hmm. That is a fantastic mechanic to put in the GM section. Because... You know it, I know it, anybody who's been GMing long enough knows it. There are times where you will fudge the dice so that your players will have more fun. Straight up. You're excited with them, tension is high, everybody's feeling the mood, and you roll that goddamn stupid fucking critical. I didn't need a d20 to roll 20 this time, you stupid goddamn die. Uh, and so you're just like, no, this, this, this is not a critical. It just big heavy hit a big heavy hit that's all it is no, there's no critical damage here yep. then we have adversary info the following are additional guidelines on crafting adversaries adversary difficulty levels adversary rules and the unique function of adversary factions first we have adversary combat rules adversaries follow most of the same rules as PCs, PCs on initiative skills and attacks However, there are some important differences. Whenever a creature attacks, use its highest virtue from power, finesse, mentality, or judgment. Do not add its virtue to the end damage result unless it is a challenging or stronger monster. All adversaries... Basically, oh, good. That's That's basically saying, unless it's a challenging or, or stronger monster, you don't get... This, this would be like, for those of you who come from a D&D &D background, and that's probably a lot of you... Um, this would be like saying, do not have monsters add the um, bonus modifier damage from their attacking attribute. Mm -hmm. You you wouldn't add your strength mod to damage if, unless they're a challenging or higher monster. I like that idea. All, all adversaries have a non-attack action, extra action, reduction, and a set number of attacks. Or sorry, not reduction, reaction. Attacks do not use up actions. However, if a player ability would interrupt an action, quote-unquote, they may interrupt w one of the attacks. If it makes multiple attacks, you choose what it attacks with. It cannot attack with the same weapon more than twice in the same round. If it is a magic adversary, they may cast one spell per turn in addition to any attacks or actions, unless otherwise stated on their sheet. Good way to limit adversaries from going Nova. Mm -hmm. See, then we have adversary factions. Some adversaries belong to a faction, a group of a group all working for the same leader, lead, or leaders, or purpose. For example, the. Mechalates are considered a faction group as their units share a memory link. Warp light units would also be considered a faction. Adversaries belonging to factions become a real threat towards PCs as they progress throughout Veil of the Void. The more PCs fight adversaries from the same faction, the more adept that faction becomes at fighting them. This gives the sense of a living universe with an intelligent enemy. It forces PCs to think outside of their normal fighting strategy. For example, your PC group has three powerful mages that have helped greatly in the past three combats against the Warp Light faction. After fighting them so much, word spread about the PC's threat. As such, the faction studied them and discovered their mage play a big part. The mage play a big part in the group's success. I think this should be mages. The next encounter, they bring along two super sensory units trained in arcane nullification. Now the PC group is caught off guard and needs to start thinking outside their standard strategy. I know I talked earlier about how much I don't like GMs who intentionally counterpick, but this is doing so with a purpose. 
This is creating a living a living world. There there is no organization in real life and in games even. And yes, I know we all play games to get out of real life, but there but there are certain things that cub that uh that are transferred over in the name of uh, verisimilitude, even if it's not the truest verisimilitude, and we always want to eschew verisimilitude when it's unfun. This is, you're working concertedly against a specific group, the warp light. They're not going to sit back while you continue to fuck up their shit after all, as we learned in the business section, they're one of the three largest factions out there. So they're going to do their research. And they're going to find something to strike back at. And this mm -hmm. is a counterpick only to something you may have already been overusing. Even then, it doesn't limit your choices. As we've seen, looking through all the classes... Mages have a lot of stuff to do outside of cast the spell. A huge amount of options. This is specifically shutting down spell casting as an option. And even then, arcane nullification is a contested arcanting check. You can still roll to see if you succeed. And if you do succeed, their nullification effort went for squat. Mm-hmm. See that not only do adversaries within a faction grow in intelligence and capabilities, they also gain additional damage and HP based on the number of encounters with the PCs. Three encounters plus ten addition plus ten percent additional damage, and twenty or twenty HP. Five encounters plus one additional attack. Eight encounters plus one bonus level in four skills of your choice, or plus four bonus levels in one skill. Ten encounters plus 15 base damage, and plus 100 HP. This is a guideline. After seeing the players, after seeing the amount of HP and, player, player, and HP and damage your players have slash deal, you should adjust it accordingly. And again, this plays back to the whole, the more you fight concertedly against a specific faction, the more they're going to do to counter your efforts. Um... I'd say if, if I have to use a video game example of this sort of natural escalation, let's consider the way enemies are introduced in Arkham Asylum. Mm -hmm. You get taught a mechanic, you get comfortable with it, and then it throws a monkey wrench in it and you've got to adjust. And you have to do this constantly. To the point where late game to the point where late game, those gargoyles that you've been relying on for stealth sections, you can't rely on them anymore. Not only that, um, those those times where you have to jump over the uh, the knife guys because you can't counter them, and also those times where you have to cape stun and then pummel the shield guys and mm -hmm. the heavies. <sighs> yeah. See, then we have adversary difficulty. When creating a combat encounter, you main want to add more difficult monsters to keep the combat interesting. To do this, add adversary difficulty based on player levels. Average adversaries, usually fought by level 1 players. Many various average adversaries can overwhelm parties at higher levels. Strong adversaries, usually can be handled by 2 to 3 level 1 to 3 players. Challenging adversaries, usually can be handled by a party of higher level players, usually around levels 10 or, or more. Premium adversaries, a difficult, sometimes world-ending challenge, even for a party of level 17 plus characters, usually requires heavy planning. And you and I have, have critiqued challenge rating, but this is a case of it being a suggestion, a guideline. Yeah. There's a lot of this those is, here. Yeah. This is more a framework rather than, no, You. this is what you should be planning for with this type of, of adversary. This is, eh, if you're going to make a challenging adversary, 
it should be planned around a level 10 plus party but you know adjust as you need to mm -hmm. then we have plus adversaries when there is a plus sign next to an adversary's difficulty level it means that they are more difficult than their level adversaries plus fall between their difficulty and the next for example wolf knights are an average plus adversary this means their power level falls between average and strong while they are not powerful enough to be considered a strong adversary, they are stronger than your normal average. Plus adversaries should be considered a bigger threat to players and could cause your fight to sway one way or another. Our combat formula considers this, but it is best to know what the adversary does before you throw them wildly at the PCs. And then we have building an adversary. Which is now, a huge section. Yep. Now that you know how adversaries work, and how to build an encounter. Let's dive into the fun part of making your own adversary. There are many ways to approach building your own adversary. I will list the steps on how I do it, but follow whatever direction best fits your style. First off, decide what you want to make. Picture what it looks like, what it would attack with, what its speed might be, and how large it is. Draw inspirations from things around you, pictures, stories, etc. After you have that picture in your mind, decide how difficult you want it to be. The following list explains how to build adversaries at varying levels. Listed below are recommendations for HP, attack counts, damage, skills, virtues, and abilities. Low HP is the lowest recommend. Recommend max. Low HP is the lowest recommend max HP. I feel like I feel like this is this needs a, a bit of fixing. Low HP is the lowest recommended maximum HP. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. It, yeah, I'm sure it's... It was worded weird. Uh, it recommended is missing um, the proper verb tense. That's mm -hmm. all. Typically easy to kill, but good use good to use in a swarm. High HP is typically the limit for that difficulty. Anything above that limit often makes the being a challenge. I'm not going to go over the bullet point list for each difficulty level, but there's... There's a good there's a good amount of ranges for each, including recommendations on what abilities would count for that level. Yeah, and we can actually see why the jump between strong and challenging is, you know, strong can usually handled by two to three level one through three characters, to challenging being ten party of, of higher level players around levels ten plus. Mm -hmm. There's a huge jump in ability there. And of course, premium is basically like fighting a goddamn battleship. So. Yep. And then we have the GM's golden rules. What is, <laughs> what is a galaxy master? A GM is the storyteller, the judge, and the guide. You're there to set up to set up a grand universe alongside your PCs, to guide them when they seek it, and to judge the rules with which they test the universe. As a GM, there are a few important things to remember. You are here to create fun. Sometimes you must make the rules, adjust your dice, or even completely ignore a rule. This is known among, among the pros as Rule Zero. Rule Zero. Fuck it. <laughs> mm -hmm. there, there will uh, always come a moment in your, in your tenure as GM where you will take a look at what is happening Take a look at the, uh, at, the, at the options open to you and the players. Realize there's no good way to address this at all, even within the framework of, of the rules as you have provided. And so you throw up your hands and you go, fuck it! And you, uh, you pull bullshit out of your ass. <laughs> the reason we always say here around the monastery you can't bullshit a bullshitter... Well, being a GM for 20 plus years makes us really good bullshitters. Mm -hmm. And then we have, then it goes, you're, then we have an example of this sort of thing, which I'm going to be skimming over. But you're the judge of the rules. What you decide is final, but this is a cooperative game. You're all working together to build something incredible. Everyone's opinion should carry weight, and every backstory or choice should have an impact. 
Whether that impact is small or large is up to you. The most important thing is to have fun yourself. If you enjoy our game, work in others' ideas, and remember that this universe is everyone's, then your game will be the best. And then at the end here, I think there are a small handful of optional rules that we mm -hmm. probably don't really need to go over. Um, I think I actually I think the optional rules should should be considered. First okay. is alternative two-handed rules. Two-handed weapons normally have no requirements other than requiring two hands to hold. These additional rules mean two-handed weapons require power or vitality of six or higher to wield, while great weapons require eight or higher. I would like to note that nine is the maximum for virtues, so requiring an, an eight or nine for a great weapon sounds a little limiting, but, you know, mm -hmm. needs must. Yeah. Um, bonus dice to auto hits. With this alternate rule, if a player has an ability that would grant them plus one bonus die and a skill that already grants plus four bonus dice, they would gain an auto hit die instead. This kind of reminds me of Roland Keith's rule of ten. Yeah, because this, this what this is is basically making sure that you don't uh, you don't uh, uh, you know overflow essentially. Mm -hmm. This overflows because you're only allowed up to four bonus dice in the whole sixteen dice schema. Um, this allows you not to waste any additional bonus dice you might accidentally get from a skill just because you've been rolling that skill so much. Mm -hmm. Um, channel interruption. With this rule, when a player or adversary attempting to channel a spell takes damage, they must make a hard for our canting or mentality check. On a fail, interrupt the channel. If a spell that is being cha that, that, that is being channeled by either a PC or adversary is interrupted this way, the spell is considered to have critically failed. I like this rule for certain reasons, but I also think it might be a dick rule. I feel like this is. I feel like this is. This is something to put in, to remind people that magic in this is not some fire and forget shit. Yeah. But I mean, we already have that. You know, you can be interrupted while channeling when you're hit. Making it so that auto fail occurs, or auto crit fail occurs, when you're hit during channeling feels like it'll eventually turn into a dick move against the players. Of course, this could all this could work both ways, but it does remind me of um, pre-5e concentration rules. Yeah. Just a little less forgiving. Um, then we have the critical healing chart. When you roll a critical medicament check with six or more hits... Roll 1d3 and consult the critical healing chart. On a 1, remove a minor injury. On a 2, the next time the target gains an auto-miss die, ignore one of the auto-miss dice. Or 3, reduce the next damage dealt to your target by your mentality. Crits on healing is something that a lot of people don't consider. This is true. See, then flanking. This optional rule gives the creature plus one pip when attacking their target from behind. I mean, that's just straight up good. Mm -hmm. We had flanking rules in, in fourth, from what you were telling me. Yep. Um, then high ground rule. <laughs> Anakin, I have the high ground! With this rule, when a PC or NPC are on higher ground, they roll with a plus one bonus die on attacks and convert attacks against the target below them. Oh, co covert, covert checks. checks. What am I saying? What do you so, say? uh, so I'm guessing that plus one bonus die really was that advantageous for Obi-Wan. <laughs> of course, he's used his weapon master check way more than Anakin has. Yep. Then instant death. As an alternative to the standard death system, you may choose to use instant death. In this system, once a character reaches zero current HP, they are instantly killed. Though they could still be revived with the right skills and abilities, there is a true threat of death. This is a fun but harsh system for more experienced RPG players and those who don't mind making new characters. It's Iron Man mode. It's Meat Grinder mode. 
Mm -hmm. I treat this as a kind as a at your own risk thing. Well, I mean, it, these are optional rules for a reason. Mm -hmm. And overkilling. There's no kill like overkill. Occasionally, an extreme amount of damage will be dealt to a PC. This damage would not just reduce a player to zero HP, but well beyond that. In those case, in these cases, this would be represented by the negative HP the PC is downed with. This can be between two to seven negative HP, depending on how much extra damage was dealt to the PC. This damage may even outright kill the PC if the action and story deems so. And lastly is hexagonal cone attacks. When using a hexagonal grid, you can use cone attacks slash spells in a diagonal direction. A good way uh, to, a good way to get your Battletech players to try out Veil of the Void. Yeah. And, and Monk, as a pet peeve, I, I do have to say it's hexagonal. Mm -hmm. you, you put the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. Yeah, bad habits. I, I get why most people don't tend to connect diagonal with hexagonal. Mm -hmm. so. But I'd it's, say this is a better um, GM guide because there is because a lot of the advice column stuff that we see in GM guides and RPGs isn't really present here. Not, yeah, at least is, not as much. Yeah. This this entire GM guide is is here is what you can do not only to uh, to uh, resolve some rule conflicts that may occur, but also to build your own fucking version of this game. Mm -hmm. I uh, honestly, that's more useful to both new GMs and experienced GMs than most GM guides I've ever come across. Um, I can't really speak to the encounter area of Heavens and Heresies because it wasn't finished, but it was it was looking much the same way. Mm -hmm. But... And oh, go ahead. I would also say that... I did... I Well, I had a bit of a laugh when it came to referencing FF14... I wonder what he was playing when he was writing this. I, I can't imagine. I appreciate the fact that I think the strongest thing in this is providing guides on how to hack every aspect and giving detailed guides on how to do so. Yeah. And of course, those guides aren't aren't uh, designed by gospel either. It's framework. Mm -hmm. They give you options and outlines and say, hey, pick and choose, do this. But remember, you're trying to have a fun game, so... You know, do what you got and make sure your game remains fun. And I can't... I can't state this strongly enough. This is a rarity in RPGs. Even in the indie scene, this is a relative rarity. More often than not, the, get the advice given is swim, damn it. A, a one of the worst parts of hand breaking on the GM side that we see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I just I this was this was nice to read through. I'm very mm -hmm. happy about it. Um, Trevor does good stuff. Not gonna, not gonna lie, Trevor, I've enjoyed this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And. As far as as far as the optional rules, there's certain there's certain ones that feel like that feel like they're meant more for people who desire a big who desire a bigger challenge, while others are ju are just nice to have, like the bonus die rule. Bonus die rule, the hexagonal grid rules, um, and critical yeah. healing. Critical healing, yes, man. Critical heals are more than just big numbers in MMOs, guys. Mm-hmm. Thank you, once again, thank you, Trevor, for acknowledging that. <laughs> but uh, overall, with this GM's guide, um, most of the rules that you see in GM's guides are already explained elsewhere in the book. Thing, you know, basic mechanics and how they interact. 
What the GM's guide specifically does when it comes to rules is explain the way that the GM can modify those interactions as necessary to resolve any issues that may occur. And then the rest of the guide is, hey, you want homebrew? Make your own. Here's a guide on how to do it. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, it's a good balance, and it's also a good acknowledgement that people are going to want to take his system, especially if they like it like we do, and they're going to want to personalize it. Because that always happens. Every playgroup does a little bit of personalization. Even if the homebrew isn't very prominent or present or prevalent, tiny things, tiny little allowances within a system here or there. Uh, when the, and then you've got guys like you and I who might just uh, hack away half a system and put in and, and bolt on our own stuff and be like, mm, yeah, this works good. Mm-hmm. Sometimes. And hell, as I was going through that, since he decided to bring up FF14, a dumb idea came, came, to my, came to my head. Okay, let's hear it. Um. Making making a making a samurai class for Veil of the Void. Okay, okay, I can see it. Um, I have a dumber idea. Gunbreaker. Field knight. That is a gunbreaker. <laughs> <laughs> to emulate what what Thancred did in the uh, in the Shadow Walker reveal trailer. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> I mean, I may need to rewatch that trailer so I can so I can so I can remind myself how how dumb to, how dumb to make it if the time comes. But that's a, but that's a story for later. He and while we've open to the air, yeah. Now the next ch- the next chapter in the book proper is on Fide- is the Fidelis guide. Yeah, the Philly Deus guide. But as we said before, we're not covering that. Yeah, Next that's... week, in our season finale, will be our de- will be our dive into the more in- more um interesting aspects. In particular, we'll be covering the we'll be covering a couple add-ons that one of them had. Co- one of them had come out while we were doing the episodes, and we and um, we had already gone past classes, so we couldn't ju- we couldn't just put it in at the last second. And another one is something that was already out when we started this, but there was no way to fit it in any of the flow that we already have. Yep. So look forward to, look forward to that, as well as our final thoughts on Veil of the Void as a whole. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!